All right, Gauntlet of Fire review. Wait, they have a dragon on staff. Vivid, where are you? I want to call him. Someone check where he is, please. Vivid Dreams. He's our makeup artist. He's a dragon. Check his horde. It's in cell block three. Lots of plushies. I don't know why he hoards plushies. More importantly, I don't care. Just do it. <sighs> Never hire friends. So this episode starts out with Rarity in a Cave. Okay, so I'm totally stealing this from DWK and his totally legit recap series. Good show, by the way. But I feel his thoughts warrant echoing. This image of Rarity in a gussied up hard hat? There is a strong argument that this totally represents her character in one of the best possible ways. While working, she never forewent the proper safety equipment, but she didn't leave it as just a hard hat. She had to make it look at least somewhat fashionably presentable. It's indicative of the fact that beneath the pretty and decorated exterior is someone at their core who is tough, sturdy, and ready for hard work. The accessories may be superfluous, but they don't take away anything of what makes the center what it is. <sighs> Thanks for being my basket holder, Spike. Basket holder? I thought it was your bodyguard! What? Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, that of course, too. It's also interesting to note how Spike's infatuation with Rarity has diminished over time. I mean, it's still there, as in he'll do whatever she asks, but even a couple looks from him suggest he's starting to get tired of her not reciprocating his affections. Drama alert! Then Spike appears to be glowing, which sets off the bats in the belfry. Then we cut to... <gasps> e! Gads! The princesses at a casual get-together? Well, no, 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 DHX, this is all wrong. You're supposed to forget about them until season finales and openers, then completely remove them from participating in the plot for no reason. We so rarely get a chance to relax and just visit. There's usually some crisis we have to deal with. Some pony always needs our help. Sorry, son, but episode or it didn't happen. Oh, well, I... Uh, yeah. Running out of things to complain about! So Rarity walks in with Spike glowing and itching. I think there's a cream for that. And the princesses pull some exposition out of their butts. I mean, their vast reserves of knowledge that they'll never share with us. Little is known about dragon culture, but this is a phenomenon we've seen before. It is the call of the Dragon Lord. Dragons glow whenever the Dragon Lord has need of them in the Dragonlands. Say dragon a few more times. You don't say it often enough. Speaking of which... <sighs> Let's see a darn it. Vivid! Where are you? I need you here because this episode relates to your species. And I mean that in a totally not tokenizing way. I'm not racist, I swear. Oi, Vivid, are you glow? Yeah, just go do ignore that. Vivid, why aren't you glowing? Why would I be glowing? Because the Dragon Lord is summoning you? She is? Wait a minute. Are you just now doing your review of Gauntlet of Fire? Uh... Dude, that episode was over a year ago. The hell have you been doing? School? Countdowns? Video games? I'm sure one of those is important. Anyway, you're one to talk. You're using my studio to paint Princess Celestia in... La laundry... Okay, now what is this? Ugh. Take a lunch break, Kitan. That just raises even more questions! It's the changeling you locked up in the cellar during your review of Amending Fences and then forgot about. I've been taking care of him, so now you don't have to explain to King Thorax why you let one of his new subjects starve while chained to a boiler. I plead ex post facto. Anyway, Gauntlet of Fire? I may not be glowing, but I assume you still want my input? Yeah, just, just get to the studio. I'll meet you there after a quick date with some brain bleach. <sighs> How do I make it stop? Apply aloe vera three times a day. We're gonna be here all day if we keep riffing like this. So the princesses say that Spike has to go to the Dragonlands and he wants to take Rarity and Twilight with him. If I have to go to the Dragonlands, would you two come with me? Oh, oh my goodness, I'd love to. We are sadly lacking any information on dragon culture and custom. So are we. Seriously, this is the first episode since season two that we've gotten anything on dragons. And the stuff we got back then wasn't exactly flattering. Also, I find it a little hard to believe that ponies know so little about dragons, especially given that Celestia is over a thousand years old by now. That raises so many questions, especially about how she got a hold of Spike's egg. <laughs> I'd appreciate that episode sometime soon. So they travel to the Dragonlands under the guise of a rock. And then they meet... Hey, look! 
It's our old friend Sparkle Warkle. Hey, hey, look, it's our old friend artificially lowered voice. Poor Vincent Tong, why can't he voice a character people like? And then we are introduced to the head honcho of all dragons of Equestria, Torch. Dragons of Equestria, hear me! Hold the phone, we've seen dozens of dragons in varying shapes and sizes from Dragon Quest. Where are they? And why is this guy the only one that's massive? He's probably like an actual lord. He takes care of a small coven of teenage dragons that live in Equestria, and all the bigger dragons are all scattered about, doing their own things. That makes sense, except for the part where we've seen large dragons in Dragonshy and Owl's Well that ends well. Did they just leave? Maybe they're more solitary or rogue dragons? I mean, they were chromatic. Oh, D&D, you infect everything. Who is that? It's Dragonlord Torch, dummy. No, next to him. And his daughter, Princess Ember. Huh, a female dragon. Haven't seen one of those yet, right, Vivid? Vivid? Another loud and obnoxious dragon, except this time he's full grown and the de facto leader. Pretty easy to see why many fans see him as a raging dictator. Eh, I'm gonna make a counter argument. I'll give you that he's loud, but he's just giving the dragons what they want. A leader who's strong and ferocious. I mean, if Garble and the other teenage dragons are any indication, those traits are highly valued among dragons. Why else would Garble put down Spike for being meek and gentle? But Torch may actually be the most legit and respectable dragon we've seen in the entire show, simply because he shows humility later on by acquiescing to his daughter's reasoning. Torch is tough, but that toughness is tempered with reason and knows when it's time to step down and let someone else take the throne. The sort of person who should be the leader. Uh, I can agree with that. Now, you could make the argument that because Garble said Torch would eat anyone who looks at his daughter means he's a bad ruler, but I say we should take that with a grain of salt because A, it's Mr. Sulfur Hexafluoride saying it, and B, for the longest time, Celestia was thought of to banish everyone she doesn't like to the moon, and we've quickly diminished that notion since. This is why I have summoned you to compete for the throne in the Gauntlet of Fire! Roll credits. Torch then goes on to explain just what this gauntlet is. One of the best video games ever made. Yeah, yeah, you dork. It's actually a competition for the title of World's Strongest, or Lord of the Dragons. The gauntlet is dangerous, for I designed it myself. Only dragons with my ferocity, strength, and determination We'll be able to finish. Man, if this gauntlet lives up to the hype, he'd probably make a great literal DM for a literal Dungeons and Dragons. Pun totally intended. So Spike tries to leave, and we get the aforementioned moment with Ember reasoning with her dad, convincing him that Spike shouldn't compete. Now, a lesser dragon like Blackstar, who's drenched in toxic masculinity, would have demanded that Spike take part in the gauntlet or else be branded a Namby Pamby, who's too girly and weak to be a true dragon. Torch, however, is cool enough to let him go with only a bit of mild ribbing. He is rather tiny. <laughs> I could squish him with my pinky claw. <laughs> 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 that wasn't a joke, it was a fact. And that is my new foreign weapon. Seriously, how did that not become a meme? Anyways, Princess Ember then tries to convince her father that she can compete, but Torch ain't having that because she's daddy's little princess. Also because she's tiny. Yeah, like size would ever stop a true dragon if they really wanted something. We're the movers and shakers of mythology, and our legends are found in every culture across the globe. We're loved and respected because of our variances in size, as well as shape and color and abilities. To say nothing of the fact that these fine dragons assembled here are still young and will grow into majestic walls of power and grace. Because they're friggin' dragons and that's how we roll! You must be pretty flexible to bend over backwards and kiss your own butt. <laughs> next bit, next bit! <laughs> when I become Dragon Lord, I will make burps an official greeting. Ew. 
When I win, I will pillage Equestria for all their pillows. Why should these ponies be comfortable while we sleep on rocks? You stay away from Tia. Vivid, what is that? Vivid, what is that? What? You expect me to kidnap an actual princess for my horde? That old school dragoning might fly with Bowser, but not a classy drake like me. When I'm in charge, the first thing I'll do is get revenge on those puny ponies. They'll regret they ever crossed Garble. We'll take whatever we want from Equestria and burn the rest. And then Celestia dropped the sun on him. All right, in all seriousness, given Celestia, Luna, and even Cadence's track record of depending on Twilight and her friends to get things done, an invasion of prepubescent dragons tearing apart Equestria in their need to overcompensate is a legitimate concern. Which is sad. We don't like seeing them portrayed as incompetent. We used to think that they were big and epic, but when we're finally shown them, you know, they're not really that impressive. I'm okay with other races being a legitimate challenge to the ponies' peaceful society, but not at the expense of their ruler's dignity. Oh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I hope that burping dragon wins. Priorities. <laughs> So, with the potential of Dragonfire being rained down on Equestria, it's obvious the ponies will need a champion of their own. There's only one thing to do, and only I can do it. I have to win the Gauntlet of Fire. It's the only way to protect Equestria from the dragons. You heard them. They have horrible plans for ponies if they win. So somehow, I have to do it. Yes, 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 that, yes, that, that, yes, that. That is more of the spike we need. The duty-bound and chivalrous spike who sees the right thing that needs to be done and is willing to do it no matter what. Yes! Now that is a dragon code you can be proud of. Not that horse hockey from Spike at your service. Don't ruin this for me! I decided to compete. I am a dragon after all. Are you sure? You can't even fly! <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, flippancy. Laughing at jokes that are never actually made. What do you mean by flippancy? Well, have you ever engaged with someone who didn't wait for you to say anything stupid, but came in assuming you were stupid and interpreted everything you said to confirm that assumption? Well, isn't that just every internet debate I've ever seen? Anyways, so the contest begins and Garble catches Spike flat-footed and smacks him off the cliff. Well, this shouldn't be too hard. He just has to swim to the volcano. Oh, sweet Muhammad! But Spike isn't the only one to get cast into the murky depths. <gasps> so <laughs> chivalrous! <gasps> Princess Ember! What do you think you're doing? Only saving your ungrateful scales! Yeah, you're welcome, by the way. Ponies? What are they doing here? They're my friends. Friends? Dragons don't do friends. Ha! Adorable. You think you can resist the friendshipping. You are, however, doing a bang-up job resisting your father, though, Ember. I have a gauntlet to win. But I thought your dad said that- I don't care what my dad said. I'll show him and every dragon who thinks I'm just some little princess there are better things than being big and strong. Damn right, girl! Preach! And then, from the heavens, a boulder smites Duke Nukem from the sky. Or, as we say around the D&D table, Rocks fall, everyone dies. And in spite of the obvious trap, and Spike knows it, he frees number four anyway, who proceeds to metaphorically dump on Spike and sees the disguised Ember. And Ember covers for Twilight and Rarity. Huh, loner with a heart of gold. Stupid sling tails knocked me down, but I've wasted enough time making small talk. Get it? <laughs> because you're too small to win this. I'm funny. Vivid, hit me. Why? I'm starting to like Garble. <laughs> Thank you. So, with a mutual trust forming between Spike and Ember, they decide to- Ow! Okay, once was enough! You sure? I think you need another one, just to be safe. Rule of three, you know? <sighs> they decide to work together. Just so you know, this doesn't mean we're gonna pick flowers or exchange necklaces or whatever pony friends do. To be fair, I'm sure we all had our misconceptions about ponies before this. Hello, Gen 3. They come across a giant cave entrance and... So what do we do now? I think we go through there. No, you go around the back and wait for the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day. Yes, you go through there! It makes no logical sense! Why is this here? Because it's on the television well, show! forget it! I'm not doing it! This episode was badly written! We were 
so worried. About us? Bah, that tunnel was cake. <laughs> Wait, how did you two get through? Twilight finally learned to teleport. I suddenly feel very, very annoyed for some reason. Then Spike saves Rarity from the flames. <laughs> oh, thanks, Spike. <sighs> it was nothing. Nothing? You just risked everything to save her. Not really. Spike was in no danger of falling, plus he's immolation proof. Then Princess Ember goes on a tirade about not being friends. Oh, so we aren't really friends? Maybe if we were in Ponyland, but like I said, dragons don't do friendship. Baka. Unfortunately, Dante the Demon Killer knows that there's no consolation prize and comes in right behind them and throws Spike off a cliff into... Spikes. Ignoring the unintentional pun there, that's straight up attempted murder. Like, how many of the other villains did that? Macho Edgelord here is hardly what I'd call a villain. He's more of a schoolyard bully. I think the more pressing matter is that we're about to witness the impaling of a minor. Ah! Ember, I thought it was every dragon for themselves. Why did you save me? That's what friends do. And I am. I mean, we are. I never should have left you back there. Ugh, please don't make me talk about my feelings. Maybe not the best time for that anyway, since Gaston's found his next dinner date. And it's a twofer. So they start fighting, Ember and Spike start covering for each other, and Spike gets the scepter. It's interesting, you know? Through nothing but being nice and the power of friendship, and a bit of beating the tar out of jerks who think they're too cool for that stuff. Indeed, Spike was the one who was finally able to get the power of the Dragon Ball. That everyone who was ever mean to me shall be <laughs> executed. What? Nah, as much as he may deserve an extra beating, Spike takes a different route. Now go start your long journey home and give every dragon you see on the way a hug. Don't tell them why. Aww. But that'll be super embarrassing! I command you to do it! Oh, I can't believe it. Ah, Spike, merciful even in revenge. But he's still got one more great moment up his scales before he bows out. The Dragon Lord is whoever brings the scepter back to your father. Besides, you'll make a great leader. I was just doing this to protect the ponies. But I know you'll protect them just as well as I would have. So chivalrous! So Ember and the rest of the dragons return to Torch, and Papa Dragon is less than amused by Ember's disobedience. But like the wise and understanding ruler he is deep down, he immediately acquiesces when shown reason. Unlike humanity's leaders, a bunch of lesser mammals. Oi! None of that. Not much really happens after this. We just have some roundup with the dragon, Spike, Rarity, and Twilight head home. Twilight threatens Ember's life and sanity with the promise of endless questions, and why do I suddenly feel Death's shadow? <laughs> Oh. And that makes three. And that was Gauntlet of Fire. Many say this is the best episode of season six. And as far as I'm concerned, they be right. Now, I'm not just saying that because I'm a dragon. Yes, you are. Okay, fine. But that's only part of what makes this episode so great. Not only do we get some actual attention for dragons and their place in Equestria, but they use this opportunity to talk about something I feel is important. You see Garble here? I've met and suffered through people exactly like him. People who like to make fun of and put down others just because they don't fit their particular idea of masculinity. And that really shouldn't be tolerated. Seeing this episode call out this behavior means a lot to me. In my eyes, MLP's theme has always been that there are many different ways to be a girl, and therefore, many different ways to be a person. This episode re-emphasizes that overarching moral. Girls can be masculine, dominant, and bold like Ember, and boys can be effeminate, gentle, and emotional like Spike. No shame in either of those. And it's cool seeing this episode celebrate both by pairing the two together in order to win the gauntlet. Me? I'm just happy we get the best Spike portrayal in the entire show. Now, I like Spike. I even go as far to say I have a man crush on the little guy. Yes, he can be incredibly selfish and greedy, and he very easily lets temptation get the better of him. And he can be cringy at points. But this episode highlights the best parts of his character. He's secure in who he is. He will stand up and do the right thing, even if he's completely outmatched. He believes the most in the goodness in people. 
He won't step over others to get to his goals. He even shows great wisdom and practicality well beyond his years. And that's the end. Well, I guess I can't launch you out because you work here. And as I've just demonstrated, you'd have a rather difficult time even attempting that. So I'm just gonna go back to my work now. Oi, Chitin, lunch break is over. Where does he even get the love to feed off of? <laughs>